Welcome to Disciple Dojo. We are continuing our walk through the lyrics of the Psalms. In the series, what we're learning is the Psalms are actually songs, and those songs have lyrics. So when we start to think of them more as artistry and less as systematic theology, then they come alive a little bit more, I think. When we take them out of memory verse mode, where we just pull out a verse here and memorize it, and look at the song as a whole, it really gives deeper meaning to what these words are that God inspired so long ago. If you've missed previous episodes, catch those in the playlist here on the channel. We've done Psalms 1 through 11, and now we're going to look at Psalm 12. They're not in strict continuity, but some of the things that we mentioned may build on things that we've mentioned in previous episodes, like one of the things we're going to look at in this psalm. So go ahead and catch up on those if you haven't already. And if you appreciate this playlist, the best way that you can show that is if you haven't already, subscribe. When you subscribe, enable the notifications. That lets you know when we have new videos coming out. YouTube doesn't always show you different videos that Disciple Dojo does. If it thinks, hey, you just want to see Bible reviews, it's only going to show you our Bible reviews. If it thinks, hey, you just want to see the Bible teaching videos, it'll only show you those. You just want to see interviews, it'll show you those. So the only way to know what all Disciple Dojo is doing is by enabling notifications. And then another way that you can help us out is by sharing this channel. Either share this video with somebody and say, hey, check this out, or by sharing some of the other videos that we have here on the channel, including our short superhero seminary videos. That's why I have these guys behind me. You would be amazed at how many people I have that message me and say, why do you have these idols? Why do you have these demons on the shelves behind you? Guys, these are toys and they're actually used for teaching purposes. So before you send me a comment asking about the idols that are around me, do us all a favor and check out our Superhero Seminary playlist here on the channel. That'll explain why, besides just me being an 80s pop culture nerd, I am surrounded by all these toys on the shelves behind me. There's a purpose to the madness, I promise. Okay, enough about that. If you're watching this video, you probably are already familiar at least a little bit with Disciple Dojo, but that's just for those of you who aren't or who may need a little reminder. Let's jump in to Psalm 12. This is a short one, only eight verses in the English. I'm gonna read it in the old NIV from the study Bible that I read and teach from. And then we're gonna look at it in the Hebrew and we're gonna point out some things and see how different translations handle different things. You guys know the drill, we do this in every episode. So here we go, Psalm 12. For the director of music, According to Shemineth, a psalm of David, Help, Lord, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished from among men. Everyone lies to his neighbor. Their flattering lips speak with deception. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and every boastful tongue that says, We will triumph with our tongues. We own our lips. Who is our master? Because of the oppression of the weak and the groaning of the needy, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. O Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. The wicked freely strut about when what is vile is honored among men. So this is a very short psalm, and this is a psalm where the psalmist is complaining, kind of like the prophet Micah in chapter 7 or Elijah on Mount Carmel. The psalmist just feels outnumbered, feels like... Everybody is lying, deceptive. He's surrounded by people using their tongues for evil. That's the main theme of this song is smooth lips and lying tongues and how the psalmist feels being surrounded by that, being immersed in a culture of that. So let's take a look. Let's dig a little deeper and see what we find. So as usual, this psalm begins with Lem Natseach for the... Natseach, whatever that is, for the director or the Septuagint translates it towards the end or to the end or for the end. So maybe this was a note for the musical director or maybe it is to be performed at the end, although I don't know how likely that is. So I just leave it upon the eighth, Mizmor le David, a song for David or to David or even by David. You could say a Davidic psalm. That way you don't have to ask, well, did David write it or did somebody write it in honor of David or for David? doesn't make a ton of difference in terms of the emotion of this psalm. And this psalm is also not based like some other psalms that we've looked at on specific events. This is a little bit more general. And it begins, Hoshia Adonai, literally. It doesn't even say save me. It just says save Yahweh. 
Hoshia, save, is the verb where Yeshua's name, salvation, he will save his people from their sins. Yasha, that's the verb that this comes from. Save Yahweh, or Adonai, or Lord. So what does he need saving from? Kigamar Hasid, for he or it has come to an end, the righteous, or righteousness. For the righteous one, and I had to add that in there because a <laughs> typo, this is my translation, and you're getting the rough draft, you're seeing how the sausage is made. But it could be for the righteous one, Hasid, or a righteous one, has come to an end, or righteousness has come to an end. Either way, you get the sense. The psalmist is looking around, there's no more righteousness. It's it's ended, it's come to an end. And then in parallel, Kipasu Umanim, for they have disappeared truthful ones or trustworthy ones, you might say. So there's no more righteousness. There's no trustworthiness. There's the parallel of what the psalmist is asking God to be saved from. And where? Well, among the sons of man. So righteousness has come to an end. Truthful ones are vanished from the sons of Adam, Bene Adam. We've seen this phrase before, sons of humanity, sons of man. It's just a way of saying humankind. And that kind of links this to the previous Psalm, at least thematically. That's what the Psalmist is complaining about. And then verse three, verse two in English, the NIV that I read said, everyone lies to his neighbor. And that's not technically wrong, but it's it doesn't I don't think it captures very well what's actually being said here. The Hebrew text here says, Shav, Shav, they speak a man to his neighbor or to his companion. But they are speaking, it's it's not just, or I want to suggest it's not just lies, which is what the NIV translates it as, but it's, and I left it untranslated, Shav. And so Shav, the reason I left it untranslated, if you pull up a word study here, it has a number of different connotations. Uh, this might be hard to see on your screen, but sometimes it's translated as false or falseness. Sometimes it's translated as worthless, worthlessness, vain, futility, vanity, falsehood, emptiness, idols even. So the word Shav doesn't mean lie. There is a word for lies, but Shav isn't it. And if you're just reading along in NIV, you might miss it. And you can see it's used a lot. Well, you may not can see it because it's really small on your screen, but it's used a lot in, it's used the most in Ezekiel. It's also used in Isaiah and Jeremiah and in the Psalms, as well as in Job. So this is like a more poetic, prophetic term. And if you do a search on it, finding those instances where it's used, the very first one to me is the most interesting. So here's the Hebrew text and it's Exodus 27. It's in the Ten Commandments where God says, you shall not misuse or take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And Alexum English just translates it as misuse, but it's literally, you shall not lift up the name of the Lord your God, Lashav, for shav, for emptiness, vanity, infutility, worthlessness. And then in Exodus 23, you see more of this range, and this would fit kind of with what we know about maybe lying. You will not spread a false report. Do not lift your hand with the wicked to be a malicious witness. So in a legal setting, giving a shav is a false report. And then Deuteronomy 5, which is sort of repeating the Ten Commandments for the next generation, there it is again. You shall not lift up the name of the Lord your God, Lashav. And this time, the Lexham English Bible, for some reason, translates it as for a worthless purpose. Whereas in Exodus, they just translated it as misuse the name. So this just shows you, you know, Bible translators have to kind of juggle all of the contextual clues, figure out how to translate it. But again, just like in Exodus, Deuteronomy 5.20, it also uses it in a legal setting about bearing false witness against your neighbor. And then Isaiah, Isaiah 1, God says to Israel, you must not continue to bring minchath shav, offerings of shav, offerings of, in this case, they translate futility, but it's, it's the same word has this range of meanings. So the question is, in the psalm that we're looking at, in Psalm 12, what is shav talking about? And the translations differ. Lexham English says they speak falseness. King James, they speak vanity. JPS, they speak falsehood. Tanakh, they speak lies. The Septuagint translated it with um, Mataya or Matea, vanity, emptiness, idleness. I actually like how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. It says, everyone talks in lie language. So 
there's a little bit of leeway of what we're going to do with this shav, but I think it's not insignificant that this is the same term used in the Decalogue, in the Ten Commandments, of lifting the name of the Lord in emptiness, in hollowness, in uselessness. So regardless of how you want to translate shav, that's what each man is speaking to his neighbor. In other words, that's what everybody's talking. Everybody is speaking shav. And then it uses this metaphor with body parts. It says literally lips of smoothness, svathlakoth, lips of smoothness in a heart and a heart they speak. That's literally what the text says. Now the NIV had their flattering lips speak with deception. How did they get there from here? Well, lips of smoothness, that's like smooth or, or slick is, is halakoth, like just, it's, it translates into English, the idiom as well, smooth talker, like a, think of just the most crooked salesman you can think of. And so smooth lips, lips of smoothness. And then this phrase, in a heart and a heart, they speak. So how do you get deception from in a heart and a heart? Well, it's a figure of speech and it means double heartedness. Like you should be single hearted. Single hearted is used throughout scripture to talk about people being loyal or being faithful or being focused. They, they, you know, your heart, the biblical concept of the lave is not like your heart as opposed to your head, but heart, your lave is just all of you, your inner self. And so the idea is your inner self, it should be singular in focus. And if it's a heart and a heart, then you're being double hearted. You're, you're, you have one intention and that's what you're talking to somebody about with your smooth lying lips. And then your other intention your heart of hearts maybe, is going in another direction. So it's a clunky idiom. If you try to translate it woodenly, which is what I did here, you would have to explain it, what it means in English. So that's where you get, like if you're reading King James, with flattering lips and a double heart, do they speak? But more modern versions like the JPS just translates the idiom as they talk with duplicity, double heartedness. Septuagint just translated it literally, encardia que encardia. They just took it as literally as possible. I like how Charles Spurgeon put it when he came to this idiom in his sermon on the Psalms. He says, they speak with a double heart. The original is a heart and a heart. So he takes that to mean one for the church, another for the change. One for Sundays, another for working days. One for the king, another for the pope. And then I like what he says here. He says, a man without a heart is a wonder, but a man with two hearts is a monster. So this is the situation that the psalmist is faced with, and he's crying out to the Lord, God, save, deliver from this. And then in verse 4, 3 in English, he will cut off Adonai all lips of smoothness. So all those smooth lips in the previous verse, God's going to cut them off. Now, God cutting things off is used metaphorically in scripture to speak of like separating from people, or sometimes it's used for like putting someone to death. They're cut off from the land of the living. In this case, it's, I think, doing double duty because it, it does speak of God's judgment, but the image is a literal cutting off the lips, which is a horrendous punishment. And people in the ancient world were known to be pretty vicious in their uh, mutilation, like conquering kings. When they want to humiliate people, they would mutilate, they would disfigure. And so this, this like stark imagery of those lying, oily, smooth lips being cut off. It's, it's a painful image. It's a shocking image. And it's what the psalmist is saying. He's either saying God will do it, or this may be like an imprecation, like may the Lord cut off all of these oily, smooth lips. I just left it translated like wouldn't literally as God will do this. And he won't just cut off the lips of smoothness. He'll also cut off a tongue speaking great things. So we would say a bragging tongue. Other translations, uh, Lexham English, the tongue speaking great boasts. King James, tongues that speaketh proud things. The Tanakh, tongue that speaks arrogance. So this is an imprecation or a promise of God's judgment to those things that are that are boast that are using their not just boasting, but like speaking arrogantly in the wicked sense, not like just bragging, you know, like any hip hop song or something, but like really using their tongues to control and dominate people. That's kind of the image or to manipulate and oppress people. And we'll see that as the song goes, because they're using these tongues speaking greatness and mainly of their own greatness. Verse five, verse four in English, who say, this is what they're saying, by our tongues, we are strong. Our lips are with us. 
who is Lord to us? So these ones who are using their tongues, they're smooth talking. They're saying, yeah, our lips are with us. Who Lord over us? Now, it, again, it's kind of clunky in English, but listen to it in Hebrew and you can hear, again, these are song lyrics and always keep that in mind. So here's how this verse sounds in Hebrew. You can hear the, not, it's not technically rhyming, but like the, the flow, the assonance. Listen to it one more time. Again, there's just, there's no way to bring that out in English, no matter how you translate it. But that's sort of summarizing what they're saying. Like, who's going to lord over us? Who's going to hold us accountable? We will say what we want. We will use our tongues to make ourselves great. And it will be at the expense of people like the psalmist. So the ones with the boastful, proud, lying tongue spoke, now they're about to get an answer to this question. Mia don lanu, who is Lord over us or who will Lord over us? Well, the Lord is about to speak. Verse six, from oppression of the afflicted and from groaning of the needy ones. So God's been hearing this. God's been hearing not just their bragging, but the oppression Mishod aninim, the oppression of the afflicted. They are using their tongues, their lips to oppress other people. The groaning of the needy. So this is like when I say think of like a deceptive salesman, that is actually not a bad image. Think of somebody who's, it's not just like, this is not talking about like language is violence in and of itself. No, this is talking about using dishonest means to gain at the expense of other people. Crooked deals, manipulative contracts, predatory lending. I mean, these are things, this is not just reserved for the ancient world. So it's not that they're saying things that the people don't like. It's not that they're using hate speech or anything like that. It, it's much more insidious. They are making themselves great using their words, using their deception at the expense of the people that they are actively oppressing. And so because of that, who will Lord over us? Well, God finally speaks. And this is one of the few times in the Psalms. I mean, there are some others, but they're, they're kind of rare where God is the one speaking. Usually it's the Psalms are people speaking to God, but here God speaks. Ata akum, now I will arise says Yahweh, I will put in safety or I will set in safety. And this is the verb yasha. Again, this is what the opening of the Psalm, save Lord. God says, now I'm going to place in safety, meaning take the psalmist and put them in safety. And then this clause at the end of verse six in verse five in English, it's hard to translate. It literally says, Yapiachlo, he will snort or pant. We saw this in Psalm 10, verse 5, where it talked about someone snorting or sneering at their enemies. And we saw that that could also, if you remember that video, that that, that image of snorting or sneering could also be uh, scoffing and was used as a figure of speech in testifying, like in a courtroom setting, which would fit with some of the language in this psalm already of being a, a witness of Shava, false witness. So it could be saying he will snort or to him could be referring to the psalmist. And it's, this is all what God's going to do against the one who is puffing or snorting at the psalmist sneering at the psalmist. That's where I think the NIV got, I will protect them from those who malign them. So uh, he snorts to him is, is a way of saying those who sneer at them or those who speak falsely, those who malign him, that lying witness. But another way of taking this to, to snort or to pant is like to pant, to long for, like to pine after to desire. And so it's, he will put in safety the one who desires it, the one who longs for it, the one, the, the psalmist, the one who's longing for God's salvation. So Hebrew pronouns are notoriously ambiguous, and that's just something we have to be open to when it comes to translation. But you see this again when you compare the different translations. Like some English says, I shall put them in the safety for which they long. King James, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The Tanakh, I will give help he affirms to him. So they're taking yapiach as like to affirm, to sp like you would in a courtroom setting, like you would witness against or you would, you know, 
testify to. And there, that's where they get, he affirms to him. And then the message, Peterson, I, I don't know what he's thinking with this one. He has, God speaks, I've had enough. I'm on my way to heal the ache in the heart of the wretched. No clue where he got that from. So regardless though, God has spoken. God is going to arise and he's going to deliver. He's going to place in safety. He's bringing that salvation that the psalmist began this psalm crying out for regardless of how you translate these two words at the end of verse six. And so now God has spoken. So the psalmist declares what's the response when God speaks. Verse seven, six in English, the sayings or the words of the Lord, imroth taharoth. There you can hear some of that assonance here are pure words. And they're not just generally pure words, but pure silver, kesef. So Yahweh's words, they're like words of not just regular silver, but pure silver. And not just pure silver, but really pure silver. So Ruf Ba'alil La'aratz, refined in a furnace to the land or to the an earthen furnace. And they're not just silver that's been refined in a furnace, but the third point of emphasis in this line, being purified sevenfold or seven times. So this is like the purest silver you can imagine. And silver in the ancient world, this was used for like money, everyday transactions. In fact, kesef, this word silver, is also a Hebrew word for money. So silver being refined sevenfold in an earthen furnace, you, we might say like that's a check and you can take it to the bank, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of a stretch from one idiom to another. But it's like your, your words are as good. I mean, we even say as good as gold. That's an English idiom. This would be close to that in Hebrew. The words of God, those are words of refined silver, sevenfold, like as pure as you can imagine. And so verse eight, seven in English, you, Yahweh, ata Adonai, tishmerem, you will guard them. So God will guard them. And the them, I take it as referring to these words, like God's pure words to watch over. God will say this to the prophets, like I'm watching over my word in order to keep it, to guard, to keep. That's what shamar means. So God will keep or guard or preserve his words that he has just spoken, which is words of deliverance for the righteous and punishment for the wicked. And so because God guards them, the tsar, he watches over us. Min hador zu, from this generation, le'alam, to the ages, to, we might say to eternity. Alam just means like a long way away. So some English translations have this as forever, and that's fine. That captures the sense of it. But then, this is what I love about this short little psalm, verse 9, verse 8 in English. It doesn't just say, so there you go, have a happy day. It notes that God's going to do all this stuff. Like it celebrates God's promised victory, but it ends back in reality. It, it's it's pragmatic. The psalmist ends like God's going to do all this and, and he's rejoicing in it. The psalmist is kind of holding claim to these words and this promise and he's not losing hope. He's not giving up, but he's also not taking this, oh, just manifest and I'll just speak it into existence and everything will be fine. None of that. The psalmist realizes right now things still aren't the way they're supposed to be. And so he ends with verse nine, Saviv Reshaim, and we've seen Reshaim in many of these videos, the wicked ones all around, Saviv means to go in a circle, all around the wicked ones, Yith Halakun, they, uh, this is a form of the verb Halak, it's in what's called the Hith Pael, and it has this sort of either reflexive or like continuous, I don't know the grammatical terms, but Hith Halak is to walk about. Sometimes people say walk to and fro. Some translations in English, they've translated this as the wicked strut about. And I think that's a great way of translating into English what literally in Hebrew says all around the wicked walk about. So while the psalmist has praised God and, and is, is clinging to this, he does look around and he sees, but right now the Rashaim, the wicked, they're strutting all around. Karum Zuluth as uplifted or as exalted worthlessness. So while people are lifting up, exalting, just like they were using their tongues to speak great things about themselves, these wicked ones, they're walking around, they're walking around and they're lifting up worthlessness. 
It's not the word shav, but I think it was, you could argue that it's a synonym. Zuluth, worthlessness, emptiness. That's what's being held up. That's the cultural values of the day. Everybody's walking around, the wicked ones, praising, boasting, speaking, deception, wickedness, lifting the name of the Lord in vain, using their tongues to get ahead, to oppress other people. That's the situation that the psalmist realizes and then bringing it back to the sons of humanity. So just like back up in the first verse of the psalm, it said, for truthful ones have disappeared from among the sons of humanity. That's what the psalmist is lamenting. He ends by re-emphasizing that the trustworthy ones, the truthful ones are gone from the sons of humanity. And all that's left are people strutting around, exalting worthlessness to the sons of humanity. So it's a cool little bookend of this phrase. Now the Septuagint does not translate this last line this way. And I don't know why, I'm not, I haven't done a deep dive into this. I can't help but thinking though, that the translators of the Septuagint in this case may not have been comfortable with the Psalm ending on like such a down note and possibly they might have thought well surely it can't mean that like this he's praising god and god's words are trustworthy and true so there's got to be something else to this phrase and so they translated this karum not as like is lifted up worthlessness but they translated it as karato upsosu according to your height and then they translated zuluth as you cared for. And so they were reading this Hebrew as a verb of some form, which I don't know off the top of my head. Like I said, I haven't dug into this. Um, or possibly they were using another manuscript tradition. That's always possible. But anyway, they translated Zuluth with you cared for. So not as the noun or adjective worthless emptiness. And then they translated to the sons of man pretty literally. To suius ton anthropon to the sons of man. So they got, they ended the psalm with, according to your height, as high as you are, you cared for the sons of humans or the sons of humanity. So two very different ways that the final verse ends of Psalm 12 between the Hebrew text and the Septuagint text. So that explains the different translations. You know, if you're reading a Tanakh, a Jewish Bible, on every side, the wicked roam when baseness is exalted among men. If you're reading the Septuagint, the ungodly ones walk around in a circle. According to your height, you treated with much care the sons of humans. The Dead Sea Scrolls, interestingly, they read, on every side, wicked people strut about when depravity is honored by society. The Dead Sea Scrolls go back to the time of the Septuagint as well. So I would argue that the Hebrew text is the original, that the Septuagint translators, for some reason, they translated this in a different way. So that's Psalm 12. It's a lament psalm by a person who's in the midst of people using their tongues for every type of worthless evil imaginable. And the contrast of the song's lyrics are between the words of the B'nai Adam, those the sons of men, and the pure words, the pure refined silver, the pure sevenfold refined silver words of the Lord that the situation as it is now, wicked people strutting around, lifting up worthlessness, is not the way it's always going to be. And it's not going unnoticed by God, even when it looks like it is. I like the fact that this Psalm verse sort of brings it back down to earth at the end. I do think that the Hebrew text is to be preferred over the Septuagint of this verse. I think it makes for a beautiful artistry where the psalmist can take us to the heights and and, and looking at God coming and, and going to put things right. And he's promising that he's going to do it, but also then ending with, hey, but in the meantime, this is the situation here. So it gives the reader hope in the midst of the shav that surrounds him, the lying lips and double-hearted nature of all of the wicked strutting around. So anyway, it's a neat psalm. Again, it flows more lyrically in Hebrew. There's just no way to bring that out in any translation, whether English or Septuagint Greek. And so that's 
part of why we do these studies here on the channel so that you can at least kind of get a peek into what's going on in the psalm that you may miss if you're just reading it through, particularly in one English translation. If you don't have access to Greek or Hebrew, it doesn't mean that you're missing out on some super secretive points that are just going to revolutionize everything. No, it just means you got to dig a little harder. You have to use different tools. However, if you are interested in learning Greek or Hebrew in order to be able to do stuff like this, it's not impossible. And there are some good online resources and digital resources available. We've reviewed a few of them here in the dojo. So check out the video where we look at original language resources and, and it may inspire you. Uh, whatever stage of life you are, you don't have to be young, you don't have to be in school, you just have to have a desire to learn and the discipline to do it. You don't even have to have money because a lot of the resources are free these days. So I'll link that video in the description below, but that's all for now. I hope this was helpful. If it was, again, we would really appreciate you sharing it, liking, leaving a comment, telling other people about it, all the stuff that just helps any YouTube channel grow. And stay tuned as we look at Psalm 13, continuing along in this series. I don't know when we're, some people are like, oh, I love Psalm 80, whatever. When are you gonna get to that? No clue. We, I do these videos in between the other projects here at Disciple Dojo. And honestly, I'm not in a rush. I'm enjoying this leisurely stroll through the Psalms. It's nice to sit and read a Psalm in numerous translations for a, maybe a week or two before I actually teach on it. So I invite you to do the same. Read Psalm 13 in as many different translations as you can between now and whenever it is, I'm able to get the next video in this series put up. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching. Take care. And as always, keep training.